Welcome to uh, what promises to be the most exciting but also the longest uh, session of uh, this conference. Um, because uh, actually we'll have uh, three sessions planned without breaks. Uh, two after uh, the presidential address, uh, the uh, Women's Committee a special session uh, organized and chaired, chaired and organized, I guess, by uh, Sarah Smith. And after that, the, uh, the Econometrics Journal special session on structural macroeconometrics with uh, Marco Del Negro and Barbara Rossi. Uh, this will prompt to be very exciting, but there will be no breaks, and I will, at the end of the presidential address, uh, make some announcements on how to, uh, for you to manage that and uh, stay alive for so long. Of course, you all want to stay for the free session, but it will be four hours, okay? So you, you will survive, but I'll give you some instructions on uh, how to do that. Um, first uh, things first, though, um, it's my uh, pleasure and honor that uh, I've been asked to introduce uh, Andrew Cheshire, um, if he needs introduction. I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I, I guess I was asked because I'm the... Uh, uh, Managing editor of the, uh, the Econometrics Journal, uh, one of the, uh, the two journals of the, uh, the Royal Economic Society. Um, actually, uh, Andrew has not been president for, for a bit, because it's the past president's lecture, but um, he was the president when we had some major changes at the journal and uh, refocused it a little bit towards econometrics that matters, matters for applied research. And one thing I remember from Andrew's pre presidency is that he very enthusiastically and warmly uh, supported all that. I think that actually goes back to, uh, follows a, uh, a long history of uh, Andrew uh, contributing to the profession, to economics and econometrics in general, but also to uh, the public good uh, more widely in society. Um, one of the early things I remember from uh, meeting Andrew was at the, uh, the economics study group meetings that he organized in Bristol for a long time, which actually brought uh, together uh, large groups of British and foreign uh, econometricians, it was always very pleasurable. And, I'm sure that there's lots of good to, uh, to UK and European and international econometrics. Uh, Andrew should be and uh, will probably be very happy to learn that, uh, that in, in these days, uh, young econometricians in Bristol have picked up on that, and it's again a very successful series that he once uh, organized himself. But more recently, uh, I think most of this, uh, this century, the 21st century, uh, Andrew has been running uh, SEMAP, the Center for Microdata methods and practice. And I think this is a hugely uh, successful uh, enterprise, bringing lots of good economics and econometrics and econom econ economists and econometricians uh, to here, to, to the UK, to Europe. Uh, I think it co has contributed a lot to, uh, to empirical microeconomics and microeconometrics. But importantly, it has also, he's also organizing in that capacity lots of courses in which uh, all that difficult stuff that we do as econometricians has been taught to uh, practitioners, people doing public policy in the UK and elsewhere, uh, and uh, showed them how to, actually, uh, how to actually use that stuff for good, for doing good stuff to society. And I think that has been immensely useful in one way in which, one other way in which Andrew has contributed to uh, society at large. Um, of course, all that um, public work uh, builds on a very long and distinguished uh, research career. I remember very early on, before I knew Andrew, uh, I was actually uh, taking inspiration already from his work with Lancaster on uh, labor market dynamics and these kind of things. At some point, I uh, stumbled on the uh, idea that in duration models that I was studying, you could actually uh, learn more about heterogeneity in those models by using the information matrix test. And one of my senior colleagues pointed out to me that a very brilliant uh, chap in, in England had already discovered that and published that in great uh, generality and published that in Econometrica, and so that was completely, uh, you know, uh, reinventing the wheel to the extent I was able to do so. That was actually Andrew's paper in 84 in uh, Econometrica. Um, and, and, and over the course of the years, I guess many of us, uh, including myself, have uh, taken inspiration from, uh, from Andrew's work. I can give specific examples, I won't, uh, uh, about instances where that happened for me. Uh, most recently, he has been working a lot on Econometrics uh, of uh, complete and incomplete models, uh, but also econometrics uh, in cases where um, maybe the data do or don't uh, give you full point identification of the parameters you're interested in and how those two things interact. Now, the time, I was actually not allowed to say anything about Roman numerals. Uh, I was instructed <laughs> over breakfast. Um, but I must confess that in the cab, I mean, uh, people that were in the cab with me, uh, some of them can actually uh, uh, confirm that, that I was, had been confused about the title. Um, so actually, I took the, the, the IV for a four. And so I was very confused, like 21st century four. And so I just, accept, I, I just accepted it as uh, immense wisdom. And so uh, 
uh, but I think it's about IV actually, instrumental variable. <laughs> Why don't you uh, give the talk? That's good. Uh, I did actually on Monday ask, uh, I mean, because I was a bit confused, I asked you about well, what is this talk going to be about, completely in line with the topic of the talk, uh, Andrew said, well, you know, he was very ambiguous about it, and he said, you know, you better show up and find out yourself, because I'm not going to tell you. And so here I am, here all of you are, and so with great pleasure, go away to your talk to, uh, hey. to clarify this, uh, this matter. Enough. <laughs> thank, thank you, Yat, for these uh, two kind comments, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, so I, that was my only joke, was that I did get an email, I think Romish was something to do with this at some point, saying, the proofreaders are a bit concerned you have a Roman numeral in your title, do you think you would, is that what it is, or would you spell it out? I said, well, it's instrumental variables, actually. And I gave a talk, something like this, in Birmingham um, a couple of weeks ago, and somebody said that it reminds me of the, making, uh, the madness of King George, where they had to take the three out when they sent it to America as a movie, because the Americans wouldn't go if they thought it was a sequel, because they hadn't seen the madness of King George 1 and 2. And I was worried here, actually, people might not come to this, because they missed the first three lectures in the series. But <laughs> as it is... Um, uh, so, um, 21st century econometrics, here we are, um, it increasingly deals with very, very complex processes uh, in which a cross-individual heterogeneity plays a key role. I'm thinking here of processes um, involving network formation, static and dynamic discrete choice, uh, uh, processes in which there are strategic interactions amongst individuals or corporate entities. And in this circumstance, it can be difficult to um, specify a complete model when the process is as complex as this, because there may be many moving parts, and economics may not shed much light on the operation of some of these elements. And in this circumstance, it can be good to take a parsimonious approach to model construction, and uh, we're going to have two maxims today. One of the maxims was introduced by Dave Donaldson, uh, in the Sargon lecture, whose name will also come up today. Uh, 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 Dave Donaldson uh, talked about Marshak's maxim, uh, and Marshak's uh, maxim uh, as expressed pithily in Heckman's, uh, one of Heckman's papers in 2000, says, use minimal assumptions to answer well-posed economic questions. Don't uh, wrap your model up with lots of bells and whistle assumptions. And what that often means is using an incomplete model. And we've used incomplete models in econometrics for decades. Right from the very start, um, we've had models of markets in which uh, markets clear by the adjustment of prices. And the very earliest paper, Koopman's Rubin and Leibniz, 1950, Coles, found, uh, Coles monograph number 10, said, well, what would happen if we just modeled the demand side of that market and left the supply side uh, unspecified, except to the extent that we said, well, there are some things we can observe that affect the decisions of producers that don't um, affect the uh, decisions of people who are demanding these products, the weather affecting the harvest, but not affecting the demand for bread in Brighton. Um, so this idea of using incomplete models when we have a complicated process is quite a common one. Uh, and instrumental variable restrictions have been a key element in constructing incomplete models. Uh, that market model is a classic example. You would run two stage least squares on quantity price data, and you would use the uh, rainfall in the plains of Canada as an instrument for um, the producer's side of the market, and then perhaps get uh, estimates of, uh, of uh, parameters that are, are not being biased by endogeneity. But instrumental variable methods have not been available in one key situation which arises very commonly in 21st century econometrics. And this is the situation in which the unobservables in the model that you propose are not single-valued functions of the observable variables. So we're all used to a classic linear model, y is z beta plus u, and in that situation, u is y minus z beta. 
And if you want to say, well, so what's the value of beta? If you presume that u and z were independent, the only question is find a value of beta such that y minus z beta, which you can calculate for all your observations, is independent of z. Job done. And if there's two values of beta that do the job, then you have a set identifying model, and if there's one, you have a point identifying model. And that's the way it's been. But IV hasn't been available in these circumstances, because if you can't write u as a single value function of the observable variables, how can you tell what values parameters need to have in order to make u, which you cannot see anymore, independent of instruments and so forth? So, well, that's what this uh, talk is about. This talk is setting out an extension of a, the classical IV model, which brings all these incomplete models of complex processes in which there's high dimensional heterogeneity, rich specifications of heterogeneity. It's going to bring these into, I hope, into 21st century econometric practice. This work is a result of a long effort, in a way, I personally started on this work in about 2006-07 when I wondered why the paper by Cherna, Zukov and Hansen in Econometrica required only to have continuous explanatory variables. And I published a paper in 2010 that just looked at binary outcome problems. Then I worked with a PhD student from EUI called Konrad Smolinski and we did work on ordered outcome models. But the work that I'm going to talk about today is almost entirely the uh, product of joint research with a brilliant co-author of mine, Adam Rosen, colleague of mine at uh, UCL until 2016, now at Duke University. So I've got quite a lot of fly miles trying to finish off work with that. Now, the details of this talk are in this paper which came out in May uh, last year um, in Econometrica. So what's the plan? What I'm going to do is to go, uh, first of all, presume that nobody knows what I'm talking about, right? And um, I'm going to define what I mean by structures, structural models, complete and incomplete models, and IV restrictions. So we're going to do that. It's going to be like a sort of lecture econometric, it's called 101 or something like that. And then I'm going to introduce what we call generalized instrumental variable models. And these uh, models are like IV models, but they apply to cases in which uh, there are discrete outcomes, uh, multiple sources of heterogeneity, uh, models incorporating inequality restrictions, such as arise, for example, uh, with positive profit conditions and auction models and so forth. Then what I'm going to do is to um, explain to you, try to explain to you how in this context we can carry, these models are going to be generically partially identifying. However much data you had, you would not be able sometimes to pin down the precise values of certain parameters or the precise shapes of certain functions, but the models will typically have identifying power and we can put bounds on parameters and confine unknown functions into, into a set of functions. Uh, and I'm going to give you the main one of our results um, and then I'm going to apply it. Um, and uh, I'm going to try to explain to you um, how that result comes about and why it has to be that the sort of result I'm going to give you holds. Um, the, um, the, um, the, the theory of this actually, so you might say, well, why didn't people do this a lot earlier? And I think one of the reasons is that the math we have to use is basically in the early 80s. Um, it's, it comes from a theory of random sets, which oddly was actually invented by economists by Bob Alman and Gerard Debreu. Um, and uh, it then went off into stochastic geometry and image recognition and computerized tomography and other fields. But it's only because we have theorems, um, I think, um, from random set theory in 1983, particularly one of Bob Alman's uh, PhD students, V. Artstein, that we are able to actually prove the results that we have in this paper. But the results are actually, I think, very simple, and I want you to kind of come away with a feeling that I can understand that, just don't make me do the proofs. So that's a good thing to do. What I'm going to do is illustrate these results using a structural model of labor force participation. That's inspired by a paper by Josh Angrist and Bill Evans in the American Economic Review in 1998. And I'm going to estimate that model uh, using their data. Um, uh, and it's probably a good idea to just look at that model now and their data, just so we can get a feel for this. And I'm going to um, use this as a little bit of a running example throughout. 
So um, the data that Angus and Evans use, and this features not only in this AER paper, it also features in mostly harmless econometrics, chapter four, IV. This is one of the big examples in there. It features uh, 254,654 observations on married women in the United States. It's the US Census public use microsample data. These are all married mothers. They're all aged between 21 and 35 inclusive. And critically, crucially, they all have two or more children. Okay? And the oldest of these children is less than 18. Um, the model is built to explain the variation in a binary outcome, Y1, all the endogenous variables are going to be Y things, and all the exogenous variables are going to be Z things. All the unobserved variables are going to be U's. That's sort of set that to rest. Um, and this variable is one if, one if a woman worked for pay in 1979, it's the 1980 census, and zero otherwise. And the explanatory variables that Angus and Evans look at there's two of them. The one they look at always is an indicator of family size, and the model is going to be about trying to understand the um, pure effect of the causal effect of changing family size on the on, on labor force uh, participation. There's lots and lots of models and estimates in their paper. All of their paper is about local average treatment effects, average treatment effects, and so forth. I am not going to run two stage least squares on binary data. I'm going to use their data to see what would happen if you try to do a structural econometric analysis using not many restrictions, an incomplete model, and a lot of restrictions, a complete model, so complete that I can do maximum likelihood estimation. And the explanatory variable of interest is a binary variable. It's one if a woman has three or more children, and it's zero if she has two children. Remember, everybody has two or more. I'm also going to include another explanatory variable, which is they use, which is one if the woman has more than 12 years of education and zero otherwise. And I'm not going to engage in defense or discussion of the quality of this as a model of the labor force participation process. It's purely a vehicle for expositing um, this work. And the model we're going to use is a probit type model. So this thing one here, One here is uh, an indicator function. The function takes the value one if the thing inside it is true, and it takes the value zero if the thing inside it is false. Uh, y1 is one or zero depending on whether beta naught plus alpha y2, which is the family size binary variable, plus beta one z1, which is the education variable, is less than u1, slightly odd way around. If alpha were positive here, then having more children would lead you to have a lower probability of participation because the threshold will be pushed up. So that's the way that's going to work. This symbol signifies independence. So U1 in here is going to be required to be independent of three exogenous variables, Z1, which is the education variable, and two other variables, which are instrumental variables. They're excluded from this equation, and I'm going to keep those a secret for the moment unless you know Uh, and this Y2 variable might be endogenous if we thought that people with uh, preferences that led them towards desiring large families, uh, that preference was correlated with their preference for working away from home in the labor market. Who knows? It could be, it could not be, it could be the other way. We want to allow the possibility. So we'd like to get the pure effect of Y2 on Y1, something that would be useful to know if we were going to change child benefits and uh, encourage people to make decisions about family size in a way that they hadn't when the data was uh, collected. So let's talk about structural econometric models. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to actually take this to their data, this model, and I'm going to, uh, and this model with these instrumental variables is going to be partially identifying. I'm going to get a set of values for beta nor beta one and alpha, and the set's going to change depending on which instrumental variables I use. If I use a strong instrument, it's going to be really tiny. By a strong instrument, I mean something that's highly correlated with this family size variable. And if I use a weak instrument, it's going to be big. And then I'm going to actually add an equation to this, just like I'll put the supply equation in with the demand equation, and I'm going to estimate a full, complete model, so complete I can actually do maximum likelihood 
and produce some points. And guess what? The points are going to lie in the sets. But guess what? I could make those points lie anywhere in those sets by completing the model in a different way. And so what we're going to see is what you could have got if you hadn't done, in fact, it's a Heckman model with everything normal and a triangular equation, all the possibilities you could have got using all possible completions of this incomplete model. And that's the point of this work, actually. And I'm going to refer to Ed Lehmer at the end uh, because this is about whimsy and fragility, if you know Ed's paper. So let's um, do some tutorial work. So this is all, I have to stress, the construction, most, many people don't know this. This is the construction of the architect of mechanism design. Uh, Leo Hurwicz was Koopman's research assistant when he arrived from Europe uh, and worked for Koopman's and figured out a construction within which to think about the identification properties of econometric models. Leo's first paper was 1943 Econometrica on the estimation of dynamic systems of structural equations, believe it or not. And then after that, he was lost to econometrics, sadly, and uh, did some quite good work. Theory. So this is the construction of Hurwicz, and if you read Koopman's expository papers in the 50s, you'll see that uh, Koopman's and Ray Assol uh, credit Koopman, uh, credit Hurwicz, Leo Hurwicz, with having invented the way that we talk about this. Structural econometrics is the construction of Leo Hurwicz, the way we do it. So we're going to talk about structures. Uh, an economic process is going to deliver values of endogenous and exogenous variables, and in order to model these, following Havelmo's uh, principles, uh, what we do is to introduce some unobservable variables and place restrictions on structures. Um, and what structures do is they specify the way in which observed Z and unobserved U, uh, lists of variables potentially, uh, deliver observed random variables Y, another list of variables. And structures involve specification of a relationship which says what values of Y, Z, and U can coexist y equals z beta plus u is such a relationship, uh, and also the specification of a conditional distribution of u given z for all values of the, of the exogenous variable z. What a model does, it defines which structures are admissible under the rules of that model. And so we've seen a model, uh, it looks like this, it says, well, y1, y2 and z1 and u1 have to satisfy that equation. Um, and furthermore, uh, and, and the equation involves a linear index and there are unknown values for these parameters and uh, whatever we see in front of us has been got by some distribution of u passing through that equation delivering distributions of y1, y2. But um, of course this isn't a complete model. This isn't a complete structure because it hasn't specified how y2 is determined at all. There's only one equation. Given y2, I know y1, but I don't know what y2 is. And, and the structure here says, well, u1 is independent of z, z's, and u1 is normally distributed. That's a famous example. Now, in all structures admitted by complete models, endogenous y is a single value function of the observed and unobserved exogenous variables. So Koopman's first example in Koopman's Rubin and Leibniz Cole's uh, Foundation monograph uh, number 10, published in 1950, is a simultaneous equations model of a, perhaps of a market with y1 and y2 being the prices and quantities. Um, and this is a complete model as long as there's a, what he actually calls a completeness condition holds, namely that alpha 1 isn't equal to 1 over alpha 2. What would happen if alpha 1 was equal to 1 over alpha 2? These would be parallel lines, and they'd either have no intersection, or they'd have infinitely many, depending on whether they were not coincident or coincident. So there's, that's a complete model, and we can get an incomplete model out of this just by yanking the demand equation out and saying, well, I don't know what the y2 equation is. Maybe it does involve y1, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's linear, maybe it's not. Maybe it has one unobservable, maybe it has many. Who knows? And the incomplete model leaves all those possibilities open, and we try to gain information about the values of alpha 1 and z1 uh, without specifying how anything else in the process is working. And it's a good trick if you can do it, and that's what Marshak's principle is all about. 
Marshak's principle is about. Try to understand the thing you want to know about, alpha 1, the coefficient on price in a demand equation, uh, which you're going to want to know if you want to figure out what your tax revenues are going to be if you start taxing this product. But let's try and do it using minimal assumptions, not specify anything on the supply side of the market. And for certain problems, that's a good thing to do. This labor force participation model is incomplete because there's no equation for Y2. Nonlinear simultaneous equations models can be incomplete. This is 21st century econometrics. This is Tamer 2003. This is the simultaneous firm entry problem. Firm 1, Y1 is 1 if firm 1 goes into the market, and Y2 is 1 if firm 2 goes into the market. And these are the profits on the left-hand side of the inequalities here. The firms go into the market if and only if their profits are positive or non-negative, positive in this case here. And whether or not firm 1 is in the market affects the profits of firm 2. This is a nonlinear simultaneous equation system in step functions, and it has multiple solutions. There are certain circumstances in which the model says either firm 1 goes in or firm 2 goes in, but not, we don't, not both, but we don't, the model doesn't tell us which one. A complete model could be got by putting a selection mechanism in here, but uh, that's going to be, uh, uh, so what happens? Well, we could say, well, firms toss a coin. One goes in or the other. It's only with heads or tails. Is it a coin? Is it a bias coin? Does the bias of the coin depend on Z? Does it depend on other things going on? Does it depend on some other unobservables? And if, unless you want to specify all that, we can't proceed to use a complete model. Model in, involving inequality restrictions are usually incomplete. An example I've worked on is models of English auctions, in which the final bids you observe bound valuations on two sides. No bids exceed anybody's valuation, and the second highest valuation must fall below the highest bid, or that person would have continued to bid. So you get inequalities, clearly incomplete models. If you give me the valuations, you can't tell what the bids will actually be. And the benefit of using incomplete models is they're focused, there's economy of modeling effort, they're robust in misspecification because you haven't specified stuff. Um, and they encompass wide classes of complete models, which is, I think, the real benefit. Um, so IV instrumental variable methods have been uh, widely used. They started off in uh, Wright's uh, book on the tariff on animal and vegetable oils, 1920, 1928. They're the absolute workhorse of incomplete model uh, identification and estimation. Uh, they typically restrict the dependence of endogenous outcomes on certain instrumental endog exogenous variables, and they restrict the dependence of unobserved variables on these exogenous variables. So here, Z is excluded from the structural equation linking Y1 and Y2. Z is not affecting the distribution of U given Z, at least in its mean, and that would be a typical IV restriction. And if you look at classical IV models, from Wright through Sargon 5859, seminal papers on IV methods, through Tile, who everybody thought invented it, but he didn't. <laughs> uh, Ted Anderson says he invented it in 1949, actually, so that's because Sargon's had it, I think. And so it goes on right through Newey and Powell, 1988, Econometrica 2003, 21st century econometrics. U is a single value function of Y1, Y2, and Z. And in the chernozukov hansen model, which is I started working on, that non-separable function is required to be strictly monotone in scalar U so that U can be written as the inverse of that function, with Y1 taking the place of U. And Rurig and Brown, Matskin, uh, simultaneous nonlinear equation models, Econometrica 2008, all of these problems have u is some single value function of things, and then u is independent of stuff, so which functions are independent of stuff, and now you're done. But this doesn't work in all sorts of models. It doesn't work in these ordered models, because you tell me y1 and y2, and all I know is u lies in an interval, minus infinity to the threshold, threshold to infinity. Ordered choice models. Uh, McFadden's uh, multiple discrete choice model for uh, travel to work. Uh, if we thought that residential location was endogenous and that people who like to walk to work might live close to work, possible, uh, then we would want to think about uh, the costs of and time to travel to work by alternative modes from where people are observed to live to be endogenous, and we might want to do an IV. But we can't do that. 
So how is econometrics actually done in these problems? Well, one way it's done is to use a uh, complete model. Guys will fill in, they'll say, well, y2 is some function of things, and then they'll go and do what are called control function methods. My job here isn't to, uh, isn't to go into that. But typically, the, sort of the, the, the other thing people do is to assume that all the endogeneity can be got rid of as long as we condition on some things which, oh, happy day, happen to have been recorded in our survey data. And that's like underlies almost all of the ATT average treatment effect literature. That just, just it just happened to work out that all the things that are causing Y two and U to be correlated are things. It's all that correlation is due to common causes. And if I only fix those common causes, then I'd be out of the problem. Might be good. Uh, and models with these restrictions can be point identifying, but which particular restrictions to use to achieve point identification is often debatable. Uh, and one of the benefits of going to a set identifying model is the set will contain all the points, the particular point identifying conditions. So, so let me now talk about um, GIV models, uh, generalized instrumental variable models. Generalized instrumental variable models can be incomplete, and they can also uh, have this property that the unobservables are set valued functions of the observables, not point value functions, set value, correspondences. I'm actually going to talk about models having point valued residuals and set valued residuals as a shorthand. I know residuals is more about data and estimates, but it's going to be a useful shorthand. These models are generically partially identifying, and once you have a partially identifying model, what you want to do is to use all of the restrictions of the model, every single one of them, uh, in an effective way, so that you completely obtain all possible structures or structural features that could have generated the data that you see. Uh, you can always find some bounds, usually by some kind of introspection, but the question is, do you have all the bounds? Uh, because you've, your duty is to try and make the best use you can of the data that you have and the restrictions of the model. And what we are able to do in this paper, or in this work, there's four or five papers, um, is characterize sharp identified sets, sharp bounds, for a very wide class of problems, to the point where um, the whole thing is automatable in the sense that there's a rule-directed mechanism for getting all the inequalities or whatever just have to give it to a machine. And it may have to be a symbolic computation in that machine, but the machines exist to do this. I'm not saying that the calculations are then easy. They're, in fact, sometimes fantastically time-consuming. But when Brad Efron invented the bootstrap in 1978, these calculations were impossible. And Sargon talks about spending hours in a laboratory with a hand calculator calculating uh, instrumental variable estimates in things that today my iPhone would just do like that. So I don't think that's an issue. But I would say that. Okay. So the job here now is this, to finish this talk, define these GIB models, uh, show you how the identified sets of structures are characterized. Once I have identified sets of structures, I can get identified sets of structural features by projection. I ask, what's the set of a structural feature? What are the set of values? So that are found amongst all the structures that are in the identified set. And again, this is more or less difficult computation. In the example I'm going to show you, it's fantastically simple, the computation of these projections, because it's just linear programming. And we can do linear programming on huge industrial scales extremely quickly, so the computations are done in the twinkling of an eye, lightning fast. And then I'll show you applying this stuff to, um, to this application, the Angristic. And this is an example with 254,000 observations. So data, is, there's plenty of data, but you're going to see that we get sets. We cannot even sign the effect of family size on labor force participation using one of our OK, so let's uh, talk about these GIB models. So as before, we're going to consider processes. They deliver values of endogenous outcomes. These are the things determined by the operation of the process. In that example, family size indicator and labor force participation indicator. 
given values of exogenous variables in that example, the education variable and the two instrumental variables. Um, and while I'll talk about those when we get to the example and motivate why we should think of them as exogenous variables. And then as model errors, we bring on board unobserved endogenous, as unobserved exogenous variables, the taste, the preferences, the unobserved characteristics of the environment and the market and so forth and so on. And any or all of these could be lists or scalars and any or all of them could be continuous or discrete. And that's like a difference with the literature. And data are only going to tell us about the probability distributions of the observable variables, y and z is what I get data on, you can imagine we have some process of observation, simple random sampling, choice-based sampling, whatever it is, such that you could know if you had enough time and money to collect data, the probability distribution of the list Y given the list Z for every value the list Z contains. And as in an identification analysis, that's what we start with. And we go from there. We say, so what could I know about the structures that could have given rise um, the structures that could have given rise to these distributions. And there's a piece of notation here. Firstly, every time I use a script font, it indicates something that could be a set. It might be a singleton, but it could be a set. Um, and when I have an argument script T inside um, this distribution, that's giving the probability mass placed on that set of values of Y by the distribution of Y given Z. So it's not like a distribution function minus infinity or something. It's a set. The argument of this thing is a set. And it turns out you need to do that. It's not just kind of confusion and uh, unnecessary detail. And what these GIV models, so what we're dealing with here is a situation as follows. We're dealing with processes, we're dealing with models such that if, if you give me the value of U and Z, there's possibly a set of values of Y because it's an incomplete model. Either firm one goes in or firm two goes in, but we can't, the model won't say which, so there's naught one, one naught, there's two possible solutions. And in my single equation IV model, there's a whole manifold, you know, Y1 equals alpha Y2 plus beta Z plus U, so Y1 minus alpha Y2 is equal to a function of beta of Z and U, but any Y1 and Y2 along that manifold is going to satisfy that equation. I'm also dealing with a situation in which Give me the values of y and z, there's possibly a set of values of u that could have given rise to those y and z. So it's not going to be feasible to write structural equations like function of uh, this function of y is equal to something involving z and u. I've got to be able to have sets. So what we do is, um, is we define a scalar valued structural function and we say all the values of y, z, and u that the model allows to occur are values that set this scalar valued structural function equal to zero, okay? Uh, or with random variables in there, this thing has to be equal to zero with probability one. So in a linear model with y1 is alpha y2 plus beta z plus u, a, st a structural function is just the left minus the right, or the absolute value of that or the square of that, or the fourth power. So there's no uniqueness for any particular problem in the, in the writing down there. Okay. So we have that. Um, and associated with any particular structural function, uh, and these are the objects that are going to occupy us for the next five to 10 minutes, are level sets of that function, the U level sets of that function. And what these sets contain is all the values of the unobservable that can give rise to a particular value of Y given Z is equal to some particular value. Okay, it's the set of values of U that set this function to zero when big Y is equal to some value little Y and big Z is equal to some value little Z. Um, and these are going to be crucial. And in a point valued residual model, these things are singleton. So in this linear model, there's the structural function, and here are the U sets. The U sets, just what you'd say, well, that's the residual. It's Y1 minus alpha Y2 minus beta Z. That's the only value of U that could deliver a particular value of Y and a particular, when Z is equal to some particular value. But in the context of this labor force participation binary outcome problem, these U level sets are are intervals 
the intervals, the structural function can still be the left minus the right, but the u sets are not singletons. If y is equal to 1, y1 is equal to 1, then u could be anywhere from the threshold up to plus infinity. And when y1 is equal to 0, it can be anywhere from minus infinity up to the threshold. And there's the puzzle. Now you tell me u is independent of z1, z2, z3, z4, z5, z6. How am I going to use that to give me information about beta naught? alpha and beta 1. And that was the challenge. Uh, that is the challenge in this, uh, in this work. And you can do it. So remember there's two things going on here. There's the relationships amongst the variables and there's the distribution of the unobservables. And here uh, what models are going to do is define structures, a structural function and a distribution of unobservables. And the distribution of unobservables, I'm just going to call it g of u given z. And we're going to presume there's one of those in a structure for every value of z that can occur. In my example, all the z's are going to be binary. I've got z1, z2, z3. They're all 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And so the support of z will be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, da, da, da. So I think 2 to the power 3 points of support for the uh, exogenous variable. And again, when I put a set in there, I get the probability mass the distribution puts on the set. And a model will say the structural function h has got to be like that indicator function. And it might say u is independent of z, so that here well, this thing actually doesn't depend on z at all. And my model that I'm going to use actually says u is even normally distributed. Mean 0, variance 1 for that particular data. So what do we mean by the identified set of structures? We're almost the end of tuition now. Sorry about this. Uh, the identified set of structures delivered by a model and a collection of distributions is the collection of structures the model admits that can deliver the distributions that we see. And if there's one structure that does that, then the model is point identifying. And if there's more than one, it's not. But there may be structural features which take the same value across all the structures that could have delivered, in which case you have a point identified structural feature. That is Gurdjieff 1950, exposited by Cooper. All those papers were written at different times. They were all written before 46 because the papers were all given at a conference in 1946. But there wasn't enough paper to print them because of the Second World War. And so the Coles Commission monograph number 10, which reports on the 46 conference, has actually came out four years later. So they're all jumbled up. They're all in one place, but they were all written at uh, So how are we going to characterize the sharp identified sets of structures in this problem? Um, and uh, two more slides and we'll have done it. And then I'm going to go to the example. Hopefully I'll have enough time to deal with that. Yeah. And uh, we can see this thing in action. So remember, give me a structural function h, and I'd like you to think of the one that I have perhaps in that example, y1 minus that indicator function. And remember that what this set u does, it says set y equal to some value, not 1, say, y1 and y2, fix a value of z. What are the values of u that can deliver y1 equals, y1, y2 equal to not 1? Well, we can see it's like these intervals, and the intervals are of different lengths depending on whether y2 is not or 1, because it's an explanatory. Okay, uh, I used to have this, I used to call this thing to talk, let's talk about sets. And I better be careful because who knows what may happen today, I'm not sure. So let's talk about sets. Salt and Pepper, great song. Uh, Richard knows that song, the old hippie. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to find another set, and this is the set of values of, well, I'm going to take a set of values of u, s, okay, hang in there, this is the rocky piece. I'm going to take a set of values of u, s, and I'm going to say, what are the values of y that can only occur when u lives in that set? I'm going to show you a picture of this. Uh, these are the values of y such that the u level set is a subset of s. Okay, because the values of u that deliver y lie in this u set, and if if this, a particular value of y can only occur when u lives in a set S, then it's got to be this u level set for that y as a subset of S. Um, 
let's look at a picture. So this is not actually, the picture for this example is not very graphic or easy to get to grips with. So this is like a stylized example. Imagine I had two U's. Imagine here's a set on the space of U. Uh, and imagine these are four level sets. Y takes four values. Y star, Y hash, Y dollar, and Y plus. And in each of these sets are the values of U that deliver up there, the values of U that deliver Y uh, star. Here are the values of U that deliver Y hash. Here, Y dollar, and here, Y plus. This is an incomplete model. How do we know? Oh, because the values of U in that intersection can deliver either Y hash or Y dollar. If it was a complete model, these things could never intersect. It's an incomplete model, obviously, from what I've drawn here, as long as there's some probability mass in that intersection here. And now we ask the question, which values of y are such that they can only occur when u lives in the set S? Well, it's the red, it's the red guy. Okay. Uh, if u lives in S, y hash can only occur when u lives in S. y dollar can only occur when u lives in S. Y plus may occur when u lives in s, but it doesn't have to. And y star actually can't happen if u lives in s. So this set is the set um, y hash y dollar. So all, what we're going to do now is write down, and this is what I think is an elementary inequality. I brought my children today, and they're going to look embarrassed at this point. Um, you can see the pressure I have on me giving a talk of my own children in the room. Um, I'm going to ask them what they think. Well, I'm not going to ask them. But I think they should be able to understand this. <laughs> and it's the following. So think about the probability Y lies in that set. Okay? The probability Y lies in that set. And notice the set is determined entirely by the structural function H. And the probability is determined entirely by the distribution of the observables that I can see. Okay? So you can calculate it for any H and any Z. Think about the probability Y lies in that set and the probability that U lies in the set S, which is the GU of S of the structure. Well, it's got to be the probability Y lies in that set has less than or equal to the probability U lies in the set S. Is it five minutes? You stop doing that. It's like the worst. I'll just put it back. It's the worst. I think what he means five next to zero. That's what he means. It's really confusing. Whew. The probability Y lies in that set can be no larger than the probability U lies in the set S. And that's got to be true for every Z. It's got to be true for every structural function I care to hazard. And for structural functions for which it isn't true for particular Gs, they cannot have generated the distribution being used to calculate the probability on the left-hand side. Okay? So the probability, Y lies in that set. Give me H, I can calculate this set. Give me the distribution of Y given Z, I can calculate this for every Z. That probability has to be less than or equal to the probability mass the GU distribution puts on S. And actually, you can apply this to the complement of S, and you get the A set associated with the complement of S, but on the right you get 1 minus this GU, and so you have an upper and a lower bound. And actually you can eliminate GU from between them, and now you can get a projection onto the space of structure, but because this has to hold for all Z, it has to hold for all S, it has to hold for all structures, and that is what characterizes the identified set of structures for all of these GIV problems. Uh, so we have a theorem which says this, and further, it turns out, there's a lot of sets on the support of continuously distributed unobservables. This sounds like a big computation that um, Apple will be pleased to sponsor as buying computers to do. But it turns out you only need to look at sets S, which are unions of U sets, and then when Y is discrete, that means there's a finite number of sets, as long as it has finite support. If the model's complete, or it has point-valued residuals, either or, these inequalities are equalities we can show. And this is the route, then, to deriving all of the classical results on IV identification and what leads to GMM and moment inequalities and so forth. So we get all the classical results out for complete models and for models with point-valued residuals. U is a function of Y and Z, as in U power and so forth and so on. 
Whether those are point identifying or not requires additional conditions, rank conditions, and previous conditions and so forth. And if U and Z are independent, notice something here. On the left, then, this doesn't depend on Z, but on the right, this should depend on Z. If it doesn't, it's not a great instrument, I can tell you. And you can see then that the more these probabilities depend on Z and the bigger the support of Z, so possibly the more identifying power there will be in this model. Uh, and that indeed is the way it's going to be. And now let's go to look at um, Angus and Evans. So we have about five, ten minutes. So here it is again. The binary outcome is, did a woman work for pay during the year of 1979? Uh, the explanatory variables are Y2, potentially endogenous. One, if she has three or more children. Zero, if she has two children, and everybody has two children. I've got an included exogenous variable, an uh, education variable. To tell you the truth, that's so we can draw some cute pictures. I'm not terribly interested in this as an economic problem. It's an expository device. And the instrumental variables are the following. The paper is somewhat famous for this. This is Josh Angris' genius, actually, in finding clever instruments for problems. Uh, one of them is Z2. And it's one if the first two children, and everybody had two children, uh, it's one if the first two children are of the same sex, and it's zero if they are different sex. So girl, girl, boy, boy, you get a one. Girl, boy, boy, girl, the two oldest children of these uh, women. And the idea here is that this is um, uh, something that's randomly assigned at conception, that you can't make choices here. There's no infanticide, presumably, where well, that's what's being assumed here. And um, furthermore, the other idea is that there's no differential costs of childcare, et cetera, et cetera, that would affect labor force participation, given you had two children that would depend on what the mix of genders is. And the other instrumental variable is a real cracker. Uh, unfortunately, it's rather rare to see. If, uh, uh, it's one if a woman at the second birth event has a multiple birth. We're going to call it twins. There's only 39 triplets or more in this 250,000 woman strong data set. And the idea here is that having twins, of course, it makes you, it, you certainly move from one child to three. So you're forced into having a unit value for the family size variable. And the other idea is somewhat dubious, in my opinion, from the people I know who've had twins, which is that having twins uh, is, doesn't affect your labor market uh, participation um, relative to having three children that weren't having two at the same time. And certainly at younger ages, you think that's slightly debatable. And so actually, what you'd expect to see is different answers coming from using these two instruments. And actually, that's exactly what you see. But one of these instruments is fantastically powerful because it perfectly predicts three children. Once, the, once you've got the twins, you've got the three children. Once you don't have the twins, it's like a random thing. Uh, and you'll see. Okay, so I'm going to consider this incomplete model. This is the one I trailed earlier. It's only got one equation. There's no equation for Y2 because economists have nothing to say. Gary Becker. A few people have something to say about fertility and family size choice, but it's not one of our forte, I would say. Um, you might think we're better at labor force participation. So we're not going to have an equation for family size. Da, da, da. Probe it. It's probe it with an endogenous variable. It's IV probe it. Stata has a command called IV probe it, but they're lying. It isn't. It's a control function thing got by having a complete model. Da, da, da. Everything normal. And I'm also going to look at a second a mo a complete model. The complete model is got by adding an equation. Uh, Y2 depends on Z1 and the instrument. And I'm going to choose one of the instruments and then the other. That's why I put Zx rather than Z2 or Z3. U1 and U2. So it's introduced an equation. Y1 doesn't appear in the equation. The U's are going to be independent of all the Z's, just like before in a way. And U's going to be bivariate, normal, mean zero, variance is one, standardization because it's binary things, so we can't observe the scale. And then there's a correlation row that we can estimate. And Heckman trails this. He has a paper called Dummy Endogenous Variables and Simultaneous Equations, uh, Econometric of 78. He calls it a multivariate probit model with shift. Not very catchy title, so you won't find that in this data. Um, they call it IV probit. That's what they do. 
And I'm going to, this is actually a point identifying model. I can go do maximum likelihood. I can get point estimates and confidence for each and so forth. This is a set identifying model. The point identifying model is a special case. It's a restricted version of the set identifying model. So that if I had the probability distributions, it would have to be the points lie in the sets. And I'm going to have estimates. My estimates are based on quarter of a million observations. So the points are going to be fantastically close to the sets. Let's just look at the power of the instruments. So this is the probability you have. You go on to a third child, uh, given that your first two children have the same sex, 0.41. And the probability you go on to a third child, given your first two children have uh, a different sex is 0.35. It's a difference of 0.06. So there's a real effect there, but it's a, not a very big effect. And, but it's a highly statistically significant effect. There's a quarter of a million observations here. P into 1 minus P upon N. It's like a huge number. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very tiny number. Actually, the T statistic for testing that these are actually equal in the population is, uh, takes a value of just over 19. So we are a long way. This is like more stars than people can normally find in the page to get in. The twins instrument is a real cracker. The probability you go on to a third child given at the second birth event you have twins is one. Or triplets. But the probability you, don't, you go on given you don't have twins is 0.38, which if you look is just the average of 0.41 and 0.35, which it's got to be, because there's only 2,100 twin second births in the 200,000. Observation. So it's a great instrument, but this is not seen very often. So let's look at the uh, identified set. So here, courtesy of Mathematica, is the identified set for alpha vertically, beta 1 and beta 0, using the incomplete model, using the same sex instrument. And this is a very depressing business, because the identified set can't even figure out the sign. You see where alpha equals zero is? That, the alpha equals zero plane actually separates these two pieces of the set. We can do things, we can prove these sets are convex polytopes, that is, they're intersections of linear half spaces. That means we can get projections by doing linear programming on these things because they're linear inequalities. And the, but the same-sex instrument is so weak, even though the effect is so significant, uh, it, it's so weak that we cannot even sign the effect of family size on labor force participation. Why should that be? Um, uh, let's look back at the model. So if we, if we look at the data here, what we see is that... Um, the probability that you work for pay conditional on same sex or not same sex is different. This is what they call the intention to treat equation. I think. We regress the outcome on the instrument. But if you look, and in fact it's significant, it's not, it is significant. The T statistic now is like a two point something number. It's not 18 or 19, but there's a significant effect. If you look at women whose first two children are boy, boy or girl, girl, they work at different rates, slightly different rates, than women whose first two children are boy, girl, or girl, boy. So it must be then, with this data, we are being told pretty strongly that this instrumental variable does affect the outcome. Now how can it affect the outcome in that model? How can it affect it? C2 doesn't appear in the equation. The model doesn't allow it in there. Use independent of Z2. So it can't come through that. The only way Z2 can affect Y1 is through Y2. And the model says that. That's the restrictions of the model say that. So any identified set using the restrictions of the model has got to say this. But Y2, if alpha was zero, there would be no route at all for Z2 to affect Y1. But it does. And so it must be that alpha cannot be zero. You can exclude it. But the data is very, very dispersed, and you can't exclude minus 0.1 and plus 0.1 with an instrument this big. So that's what's going on there. Let's now look at projections of this identified set. So here's alpha against beta 1. There's the projection of the two blobs onto the alpha beta 1 space. And these are identified sets using the same sex instrument, and now the twins instrument. The twins instrument is a cracker. Actually, because when you have twins, 
the value of, is it really five minutes? Or is you doing this again? Five minutes. Okay. That seems fair. Um, the, the twins instrument is, uh, it, it allows you to point identify the value of beta one, it turns out, because if you have twins, the family size variable isn't endogenous anymore, it's exogenous. And so you can figure out the effect of the other parameter variables. Uh, now let's look at the maximum. Right? And now with the twins instrument, you can sign alpha's positive, having a larger family, lower probability of work, it's a number between you know, 0.12 and 0.8, it's not very well determined. The reason for that is, well, the twins instrument doesn't apply to that many people, of course. Here are the maximum likelihood estimates, and well, the point I want to make here is this. The blue maximum likelihood estimate is, the blue, is that blue dot there, and the, with using the twins instrument, it's the red dot. And by changing that completion, not a normal distribution, but a 10-parameter blogins distribution, not just one U2, but many U2s, random coefficients, not a, a, a triangular model, but a simultaneous model, not a linear index, but a nonlinear index, I can put that blue dot anywhere in those two blue places. The data is whispering with the same sex instrument, and the model is bellowing. It's shouting. The data is telling you almost nothing with the same sex instrument about this problem. And the red dot can be made anywhere along the, along the red line. So let's... Uh, that's another projection. So let's finish off here. So what's to conclude? Firstly, IV models can be used with discrete outcomes and rich specifications of heterogeneity. Uh, there's a rule-directed way of characterizing sharp sets. The sets are determined by moment inequalities, and there's off-the-shelf software to estimate sets given that you have a, a bunch of moment inequalities. The calculations can be lightning fast for this particular problem, and all like it, with discrete outcomes, we're dealing with linear programming, um, and that can be done in, a, in the twinkling of an eye with problems with hundreds of explanatory variables. And particularly, it's the projections that we're interested in. Nobody wants a 29-dimensional set. What we want to know is what's the project, what values of alpha are, po are possible, even though I'm controlling for much other things. There are important applications to models of inequality restrictions. Um, we've done work with models of English auctions. I have time to talk about that. Uh, so now it's time for a little preaching. I don't know if you're ready for this. But, uh, let's give it a go. So there is, if we look around, the sort of behavior of the, uh, sort of become the anthropologist looking at the behavior of the econometrician at the waterhole, there's a thriving industry. The econometrica is full of papers that say, under the following conditions, believe it or not, uh, we can point identify structural features in very, very complex processes. Uh, conditional independence restrictions, dare I say, special regressions, all sorts of other things are available there. But these conditions are sometimes fanciful with weak foundation and economic argument. Um, it's time for another maxim. So this is the maxim of uh, Koopmans and Reyesol in the Annals of Mathematical Statistics. And here it is. I'll read it out. I think it's very important. They said in 1950, scientific honesty demands the specification of a model be based on prior knowledge of the phenomenon studied, not on the desirability of the identifiability of characteristics in which the researcher happens to be interested. They're clearly sneering a bit. This is 1950. We'd hardly started. Pity they didn't publish it in Econometrica, where some of us might have read it. Of course, we'll all sign up to that, but on the other hand, on the day, it's a different thing. But perhaps we should be wary of choosing models just because they deliver point identification of the objects of interest. And actually, when you think about the complexity of some of the processes you deal with, you perhaps should ask yourself, is it reasonable that given the scope and quality of the data economists can work with, and the complexity of the processes they deal with, is it reasonable to presume that you can point identify uh, structural features? Isn't it perhaps the case that set identification is what's going on? And then I'd sell our results by saying that what we're doing here is scoping out the boundaries of ignorance that remain once plausible restrictions and data have been fully exploited. And the important thing here is the identified sets we produce for an incomplete model contain all possible points and sets you could have got uh, using various restricted versions and particular point identifying 
conversions of these models. All the estimates need not lie in the estimated sets, of course. We're here been very lucky to have a quarter of a million observations, but nevertheless, that's the nature of the beast. And so I think it's time to uh, think of another maxim, possibly. This is uh, Ed Lima. You may or may not have read Ed Lima's tremendous paper, uh, AER 1983. Let's take the con out of econometrics. It's a paper well worth reading. It's very nicely and humorously written. An invited address in Toronto. And what Lima does is to exhort us at the end, the final paragraph, to study the fragility of inference to what he calls whimsical assumptions in a more systematic way than was being done at that time. And other people were worried. David Hendry was worried about this. econometrics, alchemy or art or science. There's various people were worried about this. It seems to have gone on to the back end of this. So uh, I think I'm allowed to proselytize a little bit as the past, past president now to the Royal Economic Society, for which many thanks. I think uh, we should spend a little more time considering partially identifying models of uh, behavior. Um, and there we are. Thank you so much.